ever uh, create. A lot of hard work has gone into this. A lot of time, energy, effort, thoughtfulness. So I appreciate everybody burning some calories and getting on planes and coming all the way out here and everybody setting up and most people are leading uh, some portion of this. So thank you everybody uh, for your time and, and, and welcome. So. So considering that this is the first time that we're ever doing this, uh, most of you are probably sitting there thinking, what the heck is this thing? So um, I want to give a mission for the next three days, two and a half days, and uh, really explain why we're here and, and why we spent this time and why we're going to spend this time getting together. Um, and that mission is in, uh, it's in the, uh, some of the literature that was sent out earlier, but it's very specific, and there are three goals. Number one is to reflect on everything that we've accomplished. So it's no accident that this is our 25th year anniversary, and a lot of us, a lot of people have been here for the majority of that time, for decades, and uh, it's, it's important to reflect on what got us here today. Uh, the second thing is to predict the future, and predict what we want to do, and talk about that, share ideas. Uh, so to reflect, to predict, and then finally, what we've started off doing, which is to celebrate. Celebrate the bonds that we have with each other. Uh, that's why we start off with, with the breakfast and hanging out, uh, because it is important. Uh, most companies throw that part by the wayside. I think it's critical. I think it's critical to build the team, to have that camaraderie, so that when you are working together, uh, you have that bond as the foundation, so that when you actually need to accomplish a task, you don't want to let each other down. So to reflect on what we've done to uh, predict what we're going to do and to celebrate the bonds that we have with each other. Those are the three goals. So with that, uh, we're going to start off by reflecting, by taking a look back and uh, taking a look at, at what got us here today and, and the history of the company. And initially, uh, I asked uh, my dad, who's the founder, to, to talk and he said that he felt most comfortable doing an interview style. So I have nothing to do with this next hour, um, uh, other than lobbing some softballs and hopefully guiding, uh, guiding the talk. So, do you want to take questions during or after? During. All right. I was just going to say, anybody who has a question at the time, just ask it. All right. Um, one thing is that, you know, there are, there are staggering statistics that most businesses fail. And, you know, I, I don't know what they are, but it's something like 90%. And within... Within the first year, they're high, and then within five years, they're even higher, and then within 10 years, they're, they're like really high. And the longer you go out, the more likely you're essentially going to fail. Um, what, what sort of got you thinking, okay, I'm going to go start a business from scratch, and I'm going to do this? Well, I had um, been in syndication for six years. I was hired by the Los Angeles Times Syndicate to be the national sales director in 1978, but for most of you were born. Um, <laughs> and what happened, after, after college, I was very interested in politics in college. I went to Georgetown University and really just loved politics. My mom's first cousin was William F. Buckley, the founder of the modern conservative movement. And I was just always reading politics. So, I th But I also liked business. And in fact, I went to the University of Chicago to get an MBA. Um, but then and during that time period, I was selling for a company that offered sales training seminars. And I met a man named Willard Colston who ran a company called National Newspaper Syndicate. And I didn't know what a syndicate was, but this is what he did. And we became friends. Uh, we'd have periodic lunches. I mean, he was a client, uh, but, but a friendly client. And, but I missed, I had founded the Georgetown Voice, or it was one of several people who founded the Georgetown Voice, which was an alternative newspaper. And so I really miss journalism. I miss writing and editing. And so I decided to make a career change when I was like 24 and, and got a job with UPI as a reporter and editor and did that for four years. Then in 1978, Willard Colston, who had gone on to become uh, head of the New York Times Syndicate, was recruited to be the new president of the Los Angeles Times Syndicate, which had really been struggling. And their, their founder had died like seven years before. And for seven years, the whole place was just drifting. And they brought in Willard to turn it around. And he read 
in editor and publisher of Trade Magazine that I had been promoted from at UPI from the Philadelphia office or from the Baltimore office to the Philadelphia office. And he, he tracked me down in Florida. I was on vacation, which I almost never took in those days, and said, um, you're the same Rick Newcomb I met with the sales guy? And I said, yeah, that's me. And he said, look, I'm looking for a national sales director who also has editorial background to basically groom to become general manager. This is what I want. And the, your, your credentials are perfect. We need to talk. Now, I had never been to Los Angeles or California um, in my life. I had grown up in Chicago and gone to school in, in the mid-Atlantic region, Washington, D.C., and stayed in Baltimore, Philadelphia. So um, he said, I'm going to come down to Florida. And that put a pressure on me. I thought, well, if he comes to Florida, I almost have to take the job. So I said, you can only come to Florida if you bring your bathing suit, meaning if you turn it a little vacation, in case it gives me the freedom to say no. Well, he came down and he told me all of his plans to turn around the LA Times Syndicate. And I must admit I was excited. And at UPI, they didn't pay very much. So um, uh, we flew, they flew my wife and me um, out to Los Angeles. I met with Tom Johnson, who was the 35-year-old publisher of the Los Angeles Times. He was brand new. His first hire was Willard Colston. He told me I would be his second hire, and I was only 28 years old. And um, that was really exciting. So we decided to do it. We moved out here. Uh, uh, you know, I had a little VW Beetle, um, packed most of our belongings in it, and got an apartment in Santa Monica, and um, went to work for the Los Angeles Times Syndicate. I've always been good at sales and sales management. And we increased sales more in one year than in the previous seven years combined. So they really took notice of this. And in those days, you had like a production department and, and, and a 20-person accounting department because it wasn't computerized. Everything was pencil and calculator. There were no ending machines. And um, the we were selling faster than they could process the sales. They weren't keeping up with it. So Willard made me general manager. And I did that. Um, so I was there from 78 to 84. And in 84, I signed Irma Bombeck, who was at the time the number one essayist in the country. Um, she was a humor columnist. She had like 700 papers. She was, at the week that I signed her, she was on the cover of Time Magazine. And in those days, Time Magazine was huge. Um, she was on Good Morning America a couple times a week. And her books would always be number one on all bestseller lists for years. And so this was a big deal, signing Irma Bombeck. And I signed her away from a syndicate that I actually had a family connection to. Um, my father had been uh, vice president, senior vice president of the field newspaper division in Chicago, which was the Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Daily News. So he was involved with what was called field newspaper syndicate. <coughs> So in 84, Rupert Murdoch bought the Chicago Sun-Times and with it, Field Newspaper Syndicate. And that's the syndicate I signed Irma Bombeck away from. My father was long retired before that, so I wasn't uh, taking from him. <laughs> and um, so Murdoch wanted to know who did this. He was really annoyed. Um, he's a competitor. And they found out, and a fellow named Bob Page, who was publisher of the Chicago Sun-Times and chairman of the syndicate, called me up and said, look, Rupert wants to meet you. He's going to be at LAX, and he's going to be in line for customs, and he wants you to go over and meet him there. And I said, no, thank you. Um, I'm not going to stand in line at customs and, and talk. That's ridiculous. They'll be all exhausted, and I, there's no point. So Paige called back and said, no, nope. Murdoch said, come to his apartment in New York. I said, that's better. So they flew us, the family, uh, my wife, my two children. We all flew to New York City and um, put us in a two-bedroom suite. It was at the UN Plaza Hotel. It was very, I wasn't used to this kind of luxury. It was pretty cool. So I get into Murdoch's apartment. He's a really nice man, one-on-one. -on -one. His kids, who we read about now, James and Lachlan and, and Elizabeth, were running around. Uh, they were teenagers then. Um, and he offered me the job to run the third largest syndicate in the world, which he had renamed News America Syndicate. And I took it. So I was 34 years old, now running the third largest syndicate in the world. During, and they had lost, besides Irma Bombeck, they had lost a bunch of other talent. So my first job was to keep the talent happy. That, mm -hmm. I knew that that was what I needed to do. So that's how I got close to Ann Landers, Johnny Hart, Mel Lazarus, Evans and Novak, Carl Rowan, Herblock. 
a lot of legendary journalistic figures, Hank Ketchum from Dennis the Menace, and um, we de de developed a great bond, and I didn't lose anybody, very, you know, once I got there. And we were signing people, um, and it was all very exciting. And then Murdoch, true to form, sold the syndicate right out from under us to, to Hearst, King Features. And um, that was pretty devastating. I mean, I was, at that point, 36 years old. Here I had been this young Turk, the youngest vice president of any division at the LA Times in the entire history of the company. And suddenly, I'm 36 and unemployed. I had $900 in my checking account, a wife, two kids, and a mortgage for a, a small house in Santa Monica. And that was, um, that was a big challenge. So what happened was I got calls from Tom Johnson at the LA Times. I got calls from the Tribune Company. I got calls from other owners of syndicates saying, we would like to bring you in as president. And the main reason they wanted to do that was because they wanted Ann Landers. She was the most widely syndicated columnist in the world, and she said, I go where Rick goes. And I thought, you know, if these other companies have so much confidence in me, why don't I have the confidence in myself? And I'd always wanted to have my own business. So I thought, okay, I'll start my own company. How do I do that? And I met with financiers in New York, and, um, you know, back in, I was flying red eyes and, and flying to Cincinnati to, to, to New York just to save money. You know, in those days, I remember Continental Airlines one time was three hours late, which made me late for an appointment with these investors. And, uh, but I was just working around the clock because it was all pretty desperate. And I started out raising a bridge loan and then a commitment and then more commitment. And then we finally raised the money and I wound up with 34% of the stock of the company. Um, and we announced that this new syndication company in... Uh, I think we made the official announcement February, it was Friday the 13th, February 13, 1987. And we announced that Ann Landers had joined us. And at that time, it was basically me, a desk, and a phone. Um, and Epi, on the, Epi her, Ann Landers' nickname was Epi. And Epi calling me like every 20 minutes. You know, I'm trusting my whole life with you. And you better not let me know. But she was really very wonderful. And that was the beginning. Um, what happened, you can see... If you're either Murdoch or Hearst, and you have this, this person, you've sold a company that consists of these high name or high profile columnists and cartoonists, and you, you're selling them. You think you have the right to sell them. Um, and typically you do, to sell their contracts. The problem was they had had three owners in three years. They had had Marshall Field, they had Rupert Murdoch, and now Hearst. So they were, they were really sick of this, and I could play off of it. I said, you know, you're not chattel. You, you, you shouldn't be bought and sold. You should make your own decisions. And so there, the big question they kept asking me was, how do we know that you won't just start up a company and sell it in a couple of years? I said, I give you my word. That's all I can, that's all I can tell you. Um, and I will say, over the years, we've, I've been offered a lot of money for creators, and I've always said no. So, um, but going back to those early days, Hearst and Murdoch lawyers were sending me letters uh, that were very scary. You know, I, I remember waking up like at three in the morning, going out to the living room couch, and my wife is a lawyer, and what she was really good at is helping me find good lawyers to fight them off, but that wasn't always so easy. Uh, but it just took a lot of guts, you know, and, and you just, I just had this, you know, I have this thing jacked at me, an iPod, I'm sure you all have one, but... Yeah. And I got these Bob Dylan songs that, and I heard one that I'd never heard before, but I keep listening to it over and over. It's something like you, you've got to serve somebody. You always got to serve somebody. Do you, do you all know that song? Yeah, yeah. No matter who you are, you could be president of a bank, president of a country, heavyweight champion of the world, you've got to serve somebody. And I made a decision early on, I served the talent. That's the only way, I found that by kissing ass to the corporate people, they come and go. And kissing ass to the editors, they come and go. But if you can keep, you know, BC, Johnny Hart and Ann Landers and Herb Locke and Mel Lazarus and Bob Novak and Rolly Evans happy, they will stay with you for life. And um, that really paid off. Because you got to remember, too, this was newspapers. And newspapers were a very traditional, old-fashioned industry. At that time, they called it a mature industry. Now we call it a dying industry or terminal <laughs> decline. But it's shifting from print to digital. And in they, you know, more than most people, newspaper editors would look at something new 
as, well, you got to wait until it had been around for 20 years before they would accept it. There's an old joke Gary Trudeau, who does Doonesbury, used to make, that a lot of editors said uh, that we'll put Doonesbury in this paper over my dead body. And so they just waited until they got it. <laughs> <laughs> So my theory was that, you know, I was thinking about this. Um, how do I, at 36, figure out how to get, get something that makes us instantly traditional, instantly established, instantly recognizable? I thought, well, I know. They have Ann Landers, have BC, have Wizard of It, have Andy Cap, have Dennis the Menace, or whatever. That they, they don't, then they won't think about Creators Syndicate or... Any, you know, young Turks, old Turks, you know, all they think about is experienced quality features. And that was the strategy, and it worked. It seems like one of the hardest things that you had to do was uh, was raise money. And uh, you talked about going through Cincinnati and all that stuff. And uh, a quote that I've heard um, is, money has faces. Where a lot of times you try to raise money, and you get the money. But unfortunately, there's a face attached with that and some strings attached with that. Um, who were some of your investors, investors and uh, how, did, how did you manage those relationships? Okay, there was a guy named Alan Feinberg who helped introduce me to a lot of Wall Street people. And I really liked Alan a lot. Um, he was really helpful. And then we had a falling out, which was unfortunate. And I, I will tell you, after the 20th anniversary, I called up, I tried to reach him, I called a mutual friend. In fact, one of the investors who had, Alan had introduced us to, I said, his name was Zev Heck, and I said, Zev, I really want to talk to Alan. I want to take him to lunch and thank him. I'll never forget, Zev said, too late. I said, what? Heart attack three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Zev was. <laughs> um, so anyway, Alan really helped me a lot. Uh, he introduced me to William Zev Heck, and Zev was uh, uh, a lawyer, accountant, tax lawyer and a very smart investor and smart businessman. Um, and he, he made commitments. And then we, I met with Robert Maxwell, who was Murdoch's nemesis. Uh, and he put up a couple million dollars for 40% of the stock. And that seemed great, but I got from him a commitment that uh, we could syndicate Andy Cap, which was very important. Um, so that was exciting, you know, we had, we had money right off the bat, so I, and I just put it in a bank. Now, in our first six months, we were spending money like a major syndicate, because that's what I was used to. And we were losing, um, I, I remember just yelling and screaming, because we could not get accurate financials. That's why I love Melissa Lynn so much, because she always gives us accurate financials. But when you don't have them, it's like driving a car, and you, you, you don't know what your gas gauge is, and you're always guessing. And Maxwell had insisted we use an accounting firm, I think it was Coopers and Librand. So I wrote to Coopers and Librand, I said, look, you guys need to tell me, come in and do the books and tell them, give me accurate financials. And they said, um, we don't do that, we audit your financials. So, and so I had a meeting with the partner and he, we had lunch. And I said, look, that is useless to me. That doesn't do me any good at all. And he said, all right, look, my best friend from USC just went through a divorce and he's, he, he's starting his own consulting accounting firm. He's really good. How about I send him in? So his name was Mike Santiago. He came in. He used to come in two or three days a week. It took him a while to figure out how we were doing. And I'll never forget, um, he came in and said to me, he used to call me Chief. He'd say, well, Chief, uh, I hate to say it, but... You've lost, we're, we're losing $25,000 a week in a business with an average sale of $12 a week. I said, whoa, whoa. So we had, we had a general manager at the time, and we had burned through, I had raised $2 million, and we had burned through almost $1 million. And I called the general manager and said, do you see these numbers? And she said, um, well, yeah, but what about the other million? <laughs> said, well, this isn't going to work. So we had, it was like around Halloween of 1987, and we had this bloodbath. I mean, I just had to let almost everybody go. I don't think anybody in this room was here then, except maybe Marianne Bellman. No. no. So then, hiring salespeople, I would only pay straight commission. I would pay no base. 
hiring editors, I think we went from 12 to 1 or something. I mean, we just really cut, cut, cut. Um, and then started building back up and just watching every penny. Um, so you mentioned uh, you mentioned Robert Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> he was such a monster. He was such a monster. Here's what happened. Maxwell bought, I think he bought Quebec Corps or something, a large printing company in Canada and North America. Maybe he bought Donnelly. I don't know. He was like the second largest printing company in North America. And he wanted first magazines. So that was Cosmo, uh, Good Housekeeping, Lady Home Journal. They own a lot of, you know, he wanted the printing contracts. So he met with the CEO of Hearst and said, what's going to take to get your printing contracts? And the guy said, you know what, we, there's a thorn in our side called Creator Syndicate because we really value King Features. And this asshole, Rick Newcomb, is taking all of our good people. And I was taking a lot of them um, because they wanted to come with me. You see, when, when we had conference calls with their lawyers, they'd say, you, you know, your client, meaning me, put the talent ahead of the corporate interests. He had a fiduciary obligation to the corporation. And our lawyer, Chuck Adamick, said, it's a sine qua non. Without the talent, you don't have, without one, you don't have the other. Without the talent, you don't have a corporation. So it's that Bob Dylan song. Mm -hmm. you got to serve somebody. And I, I thought, nope, I'm putting my money on Ann Landers, not on this corporate entity. Well, Maxwell then said, okay, uh, we want to buy you out. <clears throat> I said, I don't want to sell. He said, come to London, we'll pay first class, everything, you know, just meet with Kevin, my son, Kevin Maxwell. So I did. This was like a, a maybe, I think, August of 88 or something like that. I flew over there, and oh, but at this point we were getting close to break even because we had cut costs so much and we still had some revenue and, and uh, fiscal discipline. So I met with Kevin and he said, what will it take to buy you up? And I said, it's not for sale. And he said, well, everybody has a price. What's your price? And I said, well, Kevin, if I were to sell, I would have to give half of this money to the people who join me and the other half I would use for myself but also to help them make sure they were taken care of. And he said, fine, what number do you want? I said, I don't want to sell. He said, give me a number. I said, all right, $10 million cash. You have to give me the cash right now, $10 million. This is 1988, so by like today's dollars, it's at $20 million cash, something like that. So he said, that's fine, that's no problem. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, I need you to meet with my chief financial officer, um, Isabel Chung Murphy. And she was, uh, she was Chinese, but English with a thick, you know, British accent. So I sit down with Isabel. <coughs> Very nicely. We go over the numbers. She says, well, this isn't worth $10 million. I know that. Well, then why would you tell Kevin $10 million? I said, well, stop. This is a game, Isabel. I'm not going to play this game. I'm not selling, it's not for sale. I told him that. He said, give me a number. I gave him the number, and you're telling me it's an unacceptable number. Go tell him, <laughs> and, and it's over. And that's basically what happened. She told him that, and that was it. After that, then what? once I wouldn't sell, then Maxwell hired a law firm in New York, Wilkie, Farr, and Gallagher. It's a very prestigious law firm. And they... Um, and they assigned people to, to do nothing but harass me full time. At that point, I think, Marianne, you might have been with us for some of that. Uh, but I would get letters in the mail saying, we have reason to believe you're embezzling funds from the company. Um, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. We, need, we demand an audit, we demand this, we demand... And every time they would look at our financials, I knew Maxwell was giving them the King Features. Because I would talk to the King Features people, and they would say things like, um, oh, I see you had a better quarter last year. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was very, very difficult. Um, then I remember, and Maxwell himself, I knew was a crook. I remember seeing Arnold Schwarzenegger, I used to see him a lot at World Gym in the morning in Santa Monica for many, many years. And one time we were talking, at that point Arnold was really big with Fox, with Terminator and, and all that. And he told me he was going to go see Rupert Murdoch at a Christmas party at Fox. And he said, what, what, what's the difference between Murdoch and Maxwell? And I said, Murdoch is like the old Robert Barron image, you know, the John D. Rockefeller, um, 
I, I nicknamed him Rupert Out of My Way Murdoch because one time he was getting on an airplane and some flight attendant was in his way and he said, Out of My Way! Um, but he, you know, he had a goal, he went for it and he didn't care, he'd step on anybody. But he wasn't mean, per se. He was not sadistic, he wasn't, he was just goal-oriented. All he cared about was the goal. He didn't care one way or the other about the people. Um, that's important to understand. He, he didn't dislike them. Maxwell, I said, okay, Murdoch is like John D. Rockefeller, Maxwell is like Al Capone. That's what I said. <laughs> Nothing would surprise me. If he murders people, if he's a thief, I really don't know Arnold. But I, you know, I really regret, I'm in bed with this guy, and it's like Ann Landers used to say, if you lie down with dogs, don't be surprised. What percent of the companies did he own at that time? 40%. Oof. So you got a guy who you are analogizing to Al Capone, who owns 40% of your baby. And I own 34%. What was that like? It was very tense, I would say. Yeah, it was very it was, scary. It was. And all of our contracts had key man clauses. That's that? why Rick DeTore still has one. What's a key man clause? A key man clause was if I left the company, they could leave, they could get out of it. And I did that on purpose in case, you know, somehow he screwed me out of the, out of creators. Then um, I would have taken the talent again. So you got this crook who owns 40% of the company. Right. Then take me back to November 5th, 1991. Oh, that was something. <laughs> that was something. I think, Miriam, were you here then? What happened on that? Maxwell died. That's what you heard. Oh, yeah, that's when we used to get there. phone calls. Where were you last night? Yeah, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I asked Miriam to go over to Westwood where there was this huge new international newsstand by every English newspaper she could find. She comes back, you know, with a stack this big. I took him down to the Burger King. It's the only time in 23 years that I ever ate at that Burger King. And I just got a, you know, a table in the corner, and, um, and in those days I didn't need all the bright lights and glasses, you know, so I just read everything I read about Maxwell falling off the boat and dying, and how he had stolen over a billion dollars from the pension funds of the Mir Group employees. So, so, so basically he's running this big company, and they have this big pension fund, and he's playing foreign currency markets and he keeps losing and losing and doubling down and doubling down and essentially it was one day from either being put in prison or getting assassinated or maybe committing suicide it's sort of it's a really interesting story his, his president Jim Sullivan who was I liked a lot he's the one who at some point owned American Color or Virtus it was called Sullivan Graphics and Jim said to me he was 24 hours from leg irons and with an ego like that he could not handle it so he killed himself. Other people have said that's not true. There's all books saying the Mossad killed him because he double-crossed the Israeli Secret Service. And then there are other people who say he just fell off the boat, <laughs> which is plausible because he was very much an alcoholic and drug addict at that point because he was like Jim Hogue, publisher of the New York Daily News, told me that they had a private lunch and right in the middle of lunch Maxwell just fell asleep. Right in front of him. <laughs> He was this enormous man, you know, and, and was, you know. so I was, I remember we used to do skits at our Christmas parties, and John did a skit where something about, I was dancing like an Irish jig on his grave, you know, something like that. You think people were celebrating Bin Laden's, uh, yeah. So then I think they hired Arthur Anderson and company out of Europe to settle with the creditors, and Mike Santiago and I, Negotiated. This is, this is where Alan Feinberg and I had a falling out. Also, Alan was saying, "Oh, pay him five million, you know. Whereas Santiago was saying, "No, pay him five hundred thousand." I was on Mike's side, <laughs> and we wound up buying out at I think twenty-five cents on the dollar. So that was. Did great. you buy the whole forty percent? So you're at seventy-four at that point. I was at fifty-six percent at that point. And then who got the other? Zev Hack. Okay. He so had, the venture capitalist. Yeah. And then. And Ann Landers also had one percent. All right, um, and then. If I remember correctly, uh, 2009 was the time when you had bought everybody out and owned creators 100%. Well, I bought them out in 1999, but Zev Hack kept saying, or his negotiator kept saying, how do we know when we settle on a price that um, Newcomb won't turn around and sell the company for 10 times that price? So we put in language saying that if I sold it any time in, those, in 10 years from 99 to 09, he could participate. In the in the profit, and I knew I wasn't going to sell it. Right, so in the in the twenty five years, you've had three presidents at Creators, myself included. Right. Uh, 
there's one non you or me in there. What happened? Well, there was another person too who named Anita Anita Tobias when I hired her, and then she got married. Anita no, Ma no. Medeiros. Anita Medeiros when I hired her, and then she got married, and now she's Anita Tobias. Uh -huh. And Anita was very valuable. She was really smart and hardworking and good with the talent and good with other employees, and I liked her a lot. Um, but then it, there was sort of this toxic Anita and Mike, Mike and Anita kind of thing. And um, I decided at one point, I took each one to lunch. I said, look, I'm going to make one of you president. Um, so I said to Anita, could you, if I make Mike president, could you work for him? She said, yeah, I could. I wouldn't be thrilled about it, but I could. And then I said to Mike, could you work for Anita? He said, no. If you make her president, I'm out of here. Now, I stupidly made Mike president because, Jack, you told me that you would learn in business school that, no, you should have made Anita the president because she was the one willing to go along. And in hindsight, I can see that, and that was a big mistake on my part. So the first thing Mike did was fire her, and that was unfortunate. And, you know, she, she and I uh, went out to the Cheesecake Factory, and I said, look, I feel terrible about this. I really do. I'm in a mess because I promoted him. I'm letting him run it. So if I bring you back, I've got, let me see what I can do. So I called up Willard Colston, my old friend from the LA Times. At this point, he was chairman of the syndicate. And I said, Willard, uh, are you guys looking for anybody? He said, they actually, we're actually looking for a general manager. I said, ah, I got the one. So I even took Willard to dinner and lobbied for Anita. Hmm. So then Jesse Levine was president. He called Anita. But Jesse and I had lunch. I went down to little, I did two meals over, the, over her. Went down to Little Tokyo and had lunch with Jesse and said, you will not regret it, Jesse. He said, how do I know you're not trying to sandbag me? We were competitors. And uh, I said, Jesse, I'm not. I give you my word. So he hired her, and then a couple years later, he told me at a convention, he said, oh, thank God, you recommended Anita, we get along great, she's terrific. And then they got sold, and Jesse and Anita both lost their jobs. She's with Reuters now, I think. She's with Reuters, yes. Oh, I thought she was with Bloomberg. She was with Bloomberg, and then an old friend of mine from back in the mid-70s from UPI named Mitch Koppelman, who's the vice president of Reuters, he called me up, said, hey, what do you know about this? Anita Tobias. And I said, whoa, well, why would you ask that? He said, well, I'm thinking about hiring her, and um, I see she worked at Creator Syndicate. And you're the only, I mean, I, when, as soon as I saw Creator, I called you right away. So how, what do you think? I said, you should hire her, Mitch. So I did it again in the air. One of the things, though, getting back to you have to serve the talent. See, in, in traditional syndication companies, they would sign a cartoonist for life. They own the name, the character, the likenesses. Therefore, the cartoonists had no um, say whatsoever in their contracts. And we were the first syndicate in history to let cartoonists have a say, to give freedom in the contracts. Um, historically, the institution was the most important thing. King Features, United, United Features Syndicate, uh, Universal Press Syndicate. The, the talent comes and goes. So the, the theory was the talent comes and goes. This is what studios will tell you, but the institution remains. And that was never my philosophy, but that is what happened. I mean, all those, we started on a superstar system with Ann Landers with 1,100 papers, Johnny Hart with BC with 1,100 papers, five years later, Wizard of Id with 1,100 papers, Evans and Novak with 400 papers, Herblock with 400 papers, we, Mel Lazarus with 700 papers with Mama and Miss Peach at that time. It was always a star system, but most of those stars have died. Joyce Gilson Horoscope, Joyce died. Holly Mathis, her assistant, took over. Kathy Mitchell and Marcy Sugar took over with Annie's Mailbox. So uh, Mel is still here, thank God. Um, but that's, that's been a huge uh, change. So the, how is it if, if everything, if you told me, if you told me 10 years ago that the following people would die and creators would be doing better than ever, Ann Landers, Johnny Hart, Brant Parker, <clears throat> Molly Ivins, Herb. Evans and Novak, Herb Locke, Joyce Gilson. Joyce Gilson. You told me all those people would die, but creators would be doing better than ever. I don't think I would have believed it, but it's true. And I think the answer is, it's something you and I have talked about, Jack, that you told me once, you think, 
you hate it when people have, show loser behavior, saying, "Oh, I can't wait to win the lottery," or "I hope to hit a home run." Whereas the, the truth is, that success comes from going to work every day, doing your best. I mean, I, I like this idea of create because I said to Jack, well, "What is the whole concept? Where did you get this?" He said, "Well, Facebook does it. They call it fate, F and the number eight. And if they do it, why don't we do it?" And this is sort of like the jelly bean story. Can you tell that jelly bean story? Because I just remember being sure. blown away. Sure. Um, so the idea is, uh, you know the big like jelly belly things of jelly beans, like a ton of jelly beans. So they ask a group of people. So anybody take statistics? Okay. What what does n have to equal in order to uh, approach the normal curve? <laughs> okay. No, uh, it, the answer is thirty six. So essentially, if you get any statistics, you, you can uh, if, you, if, if you as long as you have thirty six samples, you can actually draw conclusions from that. So whether it's 36 or whatever, it's 30 or 36, or 1,036, the average is going to be pretty similar, okay? So as long as the sample size is big enough, if you have a group of people, and they guess how many jelly beans are in that jelly bean thing, um, everybody makes a guess, and you throw out the, the, the top 10%, and you throw out the bottom 10% answers, and then you take the average of the rest, you're going to be within one or two jelly beans. Wow. We, and we did it. Were you here then? No. You did it with like 12, yeah. which is not even we should, physically. We should think to do about it. doing that. But maybe today, go out, send somebody out to <laughs> bring them up to It's an amazing fact. Wow, that's great. It was unbelievable. We guessed within like. These all half price across the street. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila, were you here then? Yeah. Do you remember that? And weren't you shocked? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's, that's the idea behind Wikipedia is that you could have Comptons and Britannica and a handful of you know, white guys in Maine doing this thing, or you get everybody in the world, everybody knows a little bit, everybody edits each other, and then you get really quality stuff that's free, and then people in Africa with internet can have access to an encyclopedia. List of crowds. Exactly. Speaking of white guys in Maine, Mary Ann told a great story. <laughs> Mary Ann told a great story at dinner last night that I said, you got to be ready to tell us this story. Your first two weeks at Creators. When I was yelling at her, because she, she was in suburban Chicago with high humidity, 90 degree weather, and she had no air conditioner. I said, Marianne, set a goal to make enough commission to buy an air conditioner. But tell the story about okay. the white guy in Maine and all that. I had just started with Creators. My oldest daughter was um, three months old. And she's how old now? 24. 24. Um, okay. <laughs> um, Creators, you know, Rick, like Rick said, they'd already had the bloody bath, and so I was on 100% commission, and every day I would just sit there and make calls, and all I had was this red book and this list of states, these are your states, this is your territory, and in your red book you would look up the phone number and the newspaper editor, and people would say, Creators what? What is Creators? Because Creators was still only like a year old, and... Um, well, if I buy something from you, will you still be in business? And it was really brutal. You, I'll tell you, life is easy today. <laughs> but anyway. Well, and the other cynics were all saying they won't last. Yeah, they won't last. And, and so I just kept making call after call. And I called the editor in Bangor, Maine, a guy named Richard Warren. And the paper carried in at Dear Abby. And I said, but really seriously, Ann Landers. You know, a lot of papers are starting to put both of them in. And I didn't really know that, but I just was, like, really desperate. And, so, <laughs> and it was true. But anyway, so he said, okay, all right, all right. And we agreed on $12 a week. I mean, I was just sweating because it was so hot in this little apartment, sitting there with my foot on the baby um, bouncy chair thing, you know, <laughs> trying to keep my daughter quiet. And anyway, so... We agreed on the price. I was so excited. And I think Mary Ann Chihuahua may have been the sales coordinator. But back then I had to call the office because we didn't have, you know, fax or computers or anything to report my sale. Super excited. And that Friday I got my first paycheck. And it was like $20. Because it was a 100% commission. We didn't get regular paychecks because the bloody bath had occurred. And it's 20 bucks. And I turned to my husband and I said, see, I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, with that, uh, I think uh, we have a few minutes for questions, if there are any clarifying follow-up questions. Yes, yeah, David. Yeah. I, mean, I, know, I know, but I'm just going to toss a softball. Can you talk a little bit about the origin of the name Creators? 
and how you came up with it? <clears throat> yeah, I actually did. It was Jack Caprio, or Johnny Hart's partner. Um, we were at the Frankfurt Book Fair, and I was telling him, well, maybe I should. I knew the, the News America was being sold to King Features. I said, maybe I should start my own syndicate. If I did, I wonder what I'd call it. And he said, why don't you call it the Creator's Syndicate? You know, because that way, because uh, we use terms like talent, contributor, creator to describe the cartoonists and columnists. And I said, I like that, the creator syndicate. So then, this is very much like the, like the Facebook story. <laughs> I, we announced it as the creator syndicate. And a whole bunch of people said to me, including Mel, said, that sounds like God, the creator <laughs> syndicate. And so I was talking to Greg Evans, who does Luann, and the comic strip Luann, and I said, I'm kind of concerned. We're calling it the creator syndicate, but it, everybody says the creator is God, and, and I remember Greg said, well, that'll make Johnny Hart happy, because Johnny had just, you know, converted and become a born-again Christian, and Greg said, uh, why don't you just drop the, and just call it Creator Syndicate, and I said, well, that's a good idea, let's do that, so that's what we did. I have a technical question, when you went for your investors the first time around, yes. you had a business plan? Yes. And oh. did you create that? Like, yeah. What was, it? what did it consist of? You see, Feinberg, um, set up a meeting with a fellow who had been my boss at when I worked for Murdoch, named Don Kummerfeld, who had become an investment banker. He had been Murdoch's U.S. president, and then he had a falling out, but he was like a Harvard MBA finance guy with, with an investment banking firm. So we went over to Don's apartment on a Sunday afternoon. I had flown all night, and um, we the football playoffs were on in the background. This was in December of 86, or maybe January of 87. Um, and with the football in the background, we were putting together um, this financial plan, and Don sort of formatted it and asked me to give projected numbers and so on. They call it a, what, a pro forma income statement, where you go five years out. And we talked about being the only syndicate in history where the cartoonists could own their own work. The first time, um, you see, and the reason I did that was running the third largest Every time I talked to a cartoonist, they would bring up this issue. Hank Ketchum used the phrase, I've been hogtied my whole career. Um, Johnny Hart would say, you know, he had ownership and Mel had ownership, and there was very rare, that was a long story how they got it, and it was through the New York Herald Tribune syndicate, and they, the New York Herald Tribune went under, and they got their rights back, and then they went with Field, because he bought that syndicate. Uh, but it was really a fluke. And 90% of the cartoonists were owned by their syndicates. Mm. That's why now, I, I've got to admit, when I go to a Rubens, they see all these young cartoonists, they have no appreciation for the freedom they have in their contracts, which they owe directly to creator syndicate. If we, if we did not exist, I absolutely guarantee you, everybody would have nothing but ownership. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about long-term, short-term contracts and how that... Well, initially I said, let's just do it free agency. They'll all be so grateful. Okay, so one of the ones that, that we signed was Baby Blues. Anita had a very good eye for comics, and she picked Baby Blues. And that was a really successful comic group. We made 250 sales in five years. And at the end of when their contract was up, King Features offered them a $200,000 signing bonus. First time in, in the 100-year history of King Features they've ever paid a cartoonist a signing bonus. They've never done it before. I don't think they've ever done it since. But at that time, they gave Kirkman and Scott $200,000. And, and I remember with Baby Blues, you used to call me every morning and say, when I started, and you used to say, pretend that you have the far side 10 years ago. Go out and sell Baby Blues. Pretend you, you know, in your mind... And I mean, I just, I was on a mission to sell baby boots. I mean, it was just all I did. As a sales manager, I'd always think of yeah. stuff like that. You know, like how grateful the editor would be if you persuaded him to buy Ann Landers. Because she, she was such a strong draw to readers. Um, so, but I remember with um, Baby Blues flying to the Frankfurt Book Fair. And it was a very tired. I'd flown all night. And I was having lunch with Svante Sederblad, who was our agent in, um, in Germany, in Frankfurt, Germany. And we're at lunch, and Svante says, I want to order champagne because I have great news. And, and we had just lost baby blues. We had just been told. And I said, good, what's the great news? He said, I have signed baby blues to a $50,000 a year contract <laughs> for five years. And I said, it was great news for you, Svante, because he's still representing King, so he still got the sale. But we lost it. So after that, and we had had some others too, Crankshaft and Sherman's Lagoon, where others had gone after them, and... 
I, I remember calling Johnny Hart saying, hey, John, these young guys are not appreciative the way you are, and we need to rethink this whole freedom thing and make it fairness. So we, have, we changed it. So our new contract, starting at that time, <clears throat> would say, okay, we, you can own your rights. We'll have a relatively short-term contract, but that's not fair if we don't have some sort of residual protection. And so I studied what, what do literary agents do? What do book publishers do? And I remember talking to Anita, and she used the word, we are a hybrid between a literary agency and a book publishing company. I thought that was a very intelligent way to put it. That we're, like a literary agent, we go out and sell the writer's works. But like a book publishing company, we edit it, we distribute it, we do the accounting for it, we, co we collect the money, we pay them a royalty. They don't pay us a commission. So in that sense, we're not like agents, we're like publishers. But so it's a hybrid between the two. So I said, well, why don't we do this? We'll have a paragraph basically giving us protection long-term. So if we had made 250 sales for Baby Blues, we would, and they could be free to switch to King Features, but we would continue getting the commission on the sales we made for as long as those newspapers published Baby Blues. Just like a literary agent, if Stephen King has an agent who sells his book to Random House and The Shining, <coughs> and then King and the agent have a falling out and King gets a new agent and the new agent sells the next book to Simon & Schuster, that's fine. King has that freedom and he should have that freedom, but he can't screw the first agent. That first agent still gets the payments, the commissions from The Shining, from the first publisher. And that was the model we used, so we have that now in our contracts. I wish we could do this all day. Last question. I'm so curious about Ann Landers' 1%, because she was still alive in 1999, right? Was that something she, she was alive. sold? Or? Um, in 99, uh, I called her up and told her I was buying out... Uh, Hack and everybody else, gonna, I wanted to buy 100% of the company and I offered her a lot of money um, to buy her out. And she said, great. She, she always said. likes a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Uh, hey, where did the time go? I do this all day. But thank you so much. For sharing. Thank you. So it's, it's close to 11 now, so 15 minutes, catch up on email, bio break, anything like that. And we will start with the State of the Union by department at 11.15 on the floor. And if any of you don't know, this is my wife, Carol. She was there at the beginning. <laughs> and this is actually her first time seeing the building. Oh. No. Is that right? Really? Is it, is it I, I don't go to beaches Back. off. I, yeah. end up, I ended up in Torrance. Oh. Uh. Oh, my God. 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 O